see, and it's it's doing it's on record now. Okay. See. Record. Got it. And if you. Oops, my light went out. My light go out. Okay. Now, Judge, I am going to introduce myself, and then I'm going to introduce you as our guest for today. I'm going to ask you whether I have your permission to do this interview. And of course, you give me an affirmative response. Of course. Of course. <laughs> and then I'll ask you a little about your background. Okay. My name is Owen Brooks. I'm at the Smith Robertson Museum here in Jackson. Uh, and for the benefit of our oral history project this morning, I have Judge Fred Banks as our guest interviewee. And Judge, I'm going to ask uh, whether I have your permission to conduct this interview. Yes, you do. And Judge, I'm going to ask you to uh, give us a little bit about your background, where you were born, where you went to school, a little about your forebears, your parents, Tell us uh, a little about your background. All right. I was born here in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, probably about a couple of miles from here on Mondo Street, on the other side of the railroad tracks from here. Uh, what I year was that? That was in 1942. Uh, my parents moved around just a bit. Uh, uh, after a year, I think we moved to Detroit for a short period, and then back to Canton, Mississippi. Where my father uh, had a business deal was undertaken uh, in about 1945. And I started school in Canton, Mississippi, at Holy Child Jesus Catholic School uh, in pre primer Was that uh, elementary school? That was, that was through the second grade. And after the second grade, uh, my parents moved back to Jackson. Holy Ghost Elementary here in Jackson. Yeah, Jackson. Uh, what about your siblings? I have one brother who was born in 1949. He was born just a year before we moved back to Jackson. Uh, my mother uh, secured employment as a registered nurse at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Jackson. Your mother? And uh, let's see, you left elementary school, do you remember when? Uh, Holy Ghost was a 1 through 12 school, one through and I, I, I continued yeah. at Holy Ghost through the 10th grade. One and uh, after the 10th grade, I, I transferred to Lanier High School okay. uh, and finished uh, 11th and 12th grade at Lanier in 1960. 1960. We resided about half a block from Lanier High School. You we'll finished in there in, in 1960? In 1960. Oh, okay. And uh, your brother, did he go to Lanier also? No, my brother continued at Holy Ghost. He continued at Holy Ghost. What's your Ghost. brother's name? Carl. 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 Oh, yes, I know. I met Carl. Okay. okay. So after you graduated Lanier in 1960, which direction did the life go for you? Uh, it went to Washington, D.C. <laughs> All right. To Washington. I went to Howard University. Howard University. All right. Let me see. How did you happen to go to Howard? Well, uh, Howard at that time came through the South administering examinations to uh, students who were uh, on the top uh, or parts of their class in the South and offered scholarships to uh, mm -hmm. students. And I, I was 
perspective on it, a one-half scholarship. And, uh, and what was your desire as far as the career, uh, well, majoring that, in school? Well, well, at the time, I, I, I thought that I would uh, uh, become an engineer. Oh. Uh, and right. one of the reasons that I went to Howard uh, was because Howard did have an engineering school. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not, however, admitted to the engineering school. So that's a, a mm -hmm. story in how I came to uh, uh, not major in engineering and she had wound up the, uh, majoring in business administration and there in law school. But basically, I, uh, I've come to find out that I was not admitted to the, to the uh, engineering school because it appeared that my, from my transcript, my high school transcript, that I had not had plain geometry. Oh, plain geometry. Plain geometry. And so I had a condition in geometry, <laughs> what, what, what they uh, said about it. And when I asked my advisor what that meant, he didn't understand. Uh -oh. he, thought, he thought maybe it meant that I didn't have analytical geometry. Mm. Uh, the well, fact is, I had plane geometry, and the plane geometry grade was in the fold, in the crease of my folded transcript, really so it was difficult to see. I don't and believe. I really didn't see that until <laughs> after I'd been at Howard for about four or five years, yeah. and about to graduate, and I looked at, through my record and found that that was that was, that, that was the case. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. And that led me into, I guess, majoring in mathematics, and I was not happy majoring in mathematics. I wound up transferring into business administration, and as a business administration accounting major, I took uh, business uh, law courses mm -hmm. and found that I, I, that I had an aptitude for the law and yeah. uh, decided to go to law school. Okay. What did you hear from home in terms of what was going on? Oh, I heard a lot from, from home and from Howard in terms of what was going on. Good. Uh, she is some at, of at, at home, uh, basically, uh, there was not a lot as I perceived it growing up uh, and growing on. I mean, you know, everybody heard about uh, Emmett Till and Mike Charles Parker. Mm -hmm. uh, I vaguely heard about many others, but not very much. Uh, I had not, as a child, been um, uh, an activist. And my parents were not uh, active in the race or anything like that, uh, even though you know, my uncle was 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 the person who, who kind of answered answered the call for the 100 that we gathered in your uncle. 19 Uncle Earl Banks. Okay, tell me about your uncle. He came to the March on Washington. Is that what you? No, he didn't come to the March on Washington. I was referring to the uh, the incident when uh, when Brown was the Board of Education oh, okay. was handed down, and a group of black leaders were summoned to uh, to Jackson, Mississippi, to attend having them uh, renounce Brown. This was at the behest of the government? At the behest of the government. Yes, and I know a little about that. Yes. What did you hear about that? Well, uh, all I heard was that they told the government no. <laughs> they told the government no. <laughs> and, oh, okay. And uh, that my uncle was the, was the spokesman to, uh, for that purpose, the initial mm -hmm. spokesman for that purpose. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's recorded in, in, uh, in Aaron Henry's book. John, John didn't get the name wrong. He, he yes, yes. Charlie yes. Charlie Banks, and I think that's just the Scribner's error. It was Earl. It was Earl. It was, it was, Earl. Earl. It was never, it, it was never known as John. Uh, right. uh, so me, my uncle was a community activist. I don't know whether he was uh, in any way involved with the NAACP or any, uh, anything uh, like the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, my recollection, 59 and 60, that there, there wasn't a lot going on. Okay, you heard about the Freedom Riders coming to Jackson? The Freedom Riders came after that. Okay, 61. Oh, well, they came, they came in, yes, in 61, mm -hmm. summer 61. You're right. Uh, and the Freedom Riders in, included people that that I knew. Oh, uh, okay. Stokely Carmichael was one of the, one oh, of the Oh, you people. were in school. Yeah, I was in school with Stokely. We got, mm -hmm. we got to Howard at the same time. Oh, uh, yeah. And in fact, um, you know, most of the guys, when we say most of the guys, a lot of the people who were from Howard uh, mm -hmm. associated with, uh, uh, with SNCC and, and other organizations were, were people who were either got there with me or just ahead of me. Uh, right. uh, it was Cortland Cox at the end of Howard. Cortland? Oh, yes. Cortland was at Howard then. Mm -hmm. 
pulled them cops and Deion Diamond shaved my hair. Oh, my <laughs> Ed Brown. The last day of the freshman. Ed was there, too. Ed was there, too. Ed, mm -hmm. Ed Brown and I rode the train together to, uh, <laughs> to, to Howard. He was coming out of Baton Rouge and I uh, Mississippi, and I would catch the uh, Southern Crescent over at Meridian. Uh -huh. and, uh, so you all went to Iowa together. We were traveling to Iowa together. together. Right. Right. Uh, well, not the first time, but, but uh, I think when I returned to Howard, Ed was on the train. And I think he and I were going to go on the train and yeah. going to Howard. Uh, so that, that, that group of people. What about activism on the campus? That was Were you some, aware? That was, I was aware, oh, well, the, the first, I guess, Stokely was an activist wherever he was. Mm -hmm. True and enough. The first picket line that I ever walked was one that was organized by him. Ironically, it was a, it was a, a counter picket to uh, George Lincoln Rockwell, uh, who was picketing the, the movie The Exodus, mm -hmm. or Exodus. <laughs> and Stokely and, and one of his friends from high school, at uh, American University, mm -hmm. uh, put together a town pick and a group of people going through that and I, you know, I see Mike he, Thelwell was there too. Mike Thelwell was, a, was an upper class, I think he was probably a year or two ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. he became the editor of the Of the, uh, paper, the paper? The paper. The paper is out. Stuff, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you come home summers or did you stay in D.C.? I came home in the summer of 61. Oh, okay. Uh, I came home uh, after Stokely and others had come uh, to Mississippi and got arrested <laughs> okay. in, the free, in the Freedom Rides. Right. Uh, and, uh, in fact, I, I, I picked up Stokely and, and took him and a couple of others to take him to the court appearance mm -hmm. uh, in Jackson <laughs> later, later on that summer. Mm -hmm. That's the summer of 61? Summer of 61. Okay. Because I heard uh, of the uh, of the library city in oh, yeah, the Jackson, Jackson Library City, Jackson, Jackson okay. Library City, and I heard about the zoo, city and the zoo benches and whatever, which was somewhat surprising to me because I I never not sat on benches in, in the zoo. Of mm -hmm. course, it may be that the sat on was not disturbed. You um, knew people like Collier and yeah, Col Collier. Yeah, Collier, but there was a year ahead of me than there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And who else? Did that's who I mentioned. Hey. Cody Liddell. Yeah. All right. I'm going to interview her this weekend in New York. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And uh, you knew about the organization of the Youth Council in North Jackson? Now that I didn't know about. I was, I was kind of, I, I think I vaguely understood that Coley was, was involved with, with uh, mm -hmm. the NAACP or one organization, but I didn't really know okay. what it was. What about the Tougaloo students that were involved? Did you know some of them? Uh, if you name them, I probably involved at what time? At what During point? those uh, early days in 61, 62? 61, 62, I knew some of them. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, in, in, 60, in 61, uh, during the summer of 61, uh, that, were, that was recruitment basically on the streets to, to move. Okay. And two of the people who were recruited were uh, good friends of mine. One was Jimmy Travis. Jimmy Travis. And the other one was Harold Keelan. Okay. And Harold and Jimmy first uh, went to McComb uh, to be involved with voter registration efforts down in McComb. Down in McComb. Uh, yeah. Jesse Harris? Huh? Jesse Harris from, was from here. I see Jesse all the time. I knew, yeah, I knew Jesse Harris very, but not as well as him. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's good. Jimmy and uh, Jimmy went to Tougaloo. Uh, he may have during that time. Yeah, he was a year he was a year behind me in school. In school. Uh, both Harold and Jimmy I knew from Holy Ghost. I've been. Uh, How about uh, Sanders? Which Sanders? That would be uh, the judge down in uh, in. Uh, Everett, not Everett, no. Everett, Everett. yeah, Everett. Well, Everett. Everett was at Lanier for a senior year. I'm pretty sure. Everett he, was he was behind me. Oh, yeah, I was on there for two years. Oh, okay. Uh, the the 50, uh, 58, 59, 59, 60. Oh, right. And Everett was three or four years younger than me. Oh, oh okay. I didn't realize that. Well, we old men. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now which way did life turn then? After, I guess he graduated Harvard again? In 1965. 65. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that also at, at Harvard we, uh, we did 
did some sitting in in, in Baltimore. Uh, oh. Uh, mm -hmm. Sto again, Stokely and, and Ed Brown were organizing, uh, helping with the, with the movement in Maryland. Uh, yeah. And sat in the restaurants in Baltimore. Uh, but after that, I just struggled to try to get out of school. So, okay. <laughs> but you heard about the summer of 64, yeah? I heard about the summer of 64. Oh, okay. Did you come home that time? I, for a brief time. Brief for a brief time. For the, uh, after, after the summer of 61, I never spent a full summer uh, in Mississippi. Uh, right. Uh, I uh, spent the summer in Washington working. Ironically, I was in Jackson during the march on Washington. Okay. You were in Jackson? I was in 63. But no, I, because I yeah. left, I left, I spent the whole summer in Washington. Uh -huh. I left in in, uh, in early August to come to spend August August at home uh -huh. uh, during the march on Washington. Um, and I spent all the summers in summer school uh, and working in Washington uh, in 62, 63, and, and 64. And I finished in 1965 uh, went to law school. In, at Howard. In you know, what, was, what was your brother there? Where was your brother at Powell then? Carl you were at Howard, where was Carl? Carl finished Tuberville in 1967. Oh, Carl was at Tuberville. Yeah. 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 So, how'd you tell us how you got to uh, law school. I uh, applied and was accepted. <laughs> Basically, you just, as, you know, I, as I said, I, I, uh, I, I took business law courses mm -hmm. uh, in, in, uh, in my undergraduate to uh, met lawyers. Uh, one, of, one of my professors was an adjunct. He was a, a lawyer and a CPA. Uh, and I think I had aspirations to be a lawyer and a CPA as he was uh, at that time. But I, I, I enjoyed the law. And during my last year in undergraduate school, my roommate, uh, my apartment guy, she had an apartment that was a, a first year law school. He was a guy who started out with uh, the guy finished on time. Yeah. Oh, who, who was that? John P. John P. Was he from? He's from Houston, Texas. Oh, Houston, Texas. Oh, okay. uh, and uh, so that 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 gave me an exposure to to had apprehensions to law, about going to Ole Miss. What? Did you have apprehensions about going to Ole Miss during those days? Uh, I I did. I didn't think that Ole Miss was was really an option. Um, and it, but partially because you know my grades in undergraduate school weren't the best. Mm -hmm. I had such a struggle getting out of undergraduate school. I didn't, I didn't look at many options other than Howard Law School. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 but I did think about going to Ole Miss because uh, Reuben, uh, okay, Reuben Anderson. Reuben Anderson. You know, Was he a childhood friend? Yes. Okay. We, we, Tell us about that. Reuben, Reuben came to Holy Ghost. I came in third grade. He came in fifth grade. Uh -huh. and so we were uh, classmates, uh, fifth through tenth. We decided together uh, uh, to leave and go to the public schools, pursue mm -hmm. athletics and other things. <laughs> and he went to Jim Hill and I went to the university. So we remained friends from, uh, okay. from, from fifth grade. Were you all in law school together? We were in law school at the same time. During the same but, time. Uh, uh, Reuben uh, finished two in 64 and started at uh, law school at Southern in Baton Rouge. Oh, okay. And he transferred to Ole Miss in 65, in 65. Uh, which was the same year that I entered Howard. Oh, okay. so and he's I a did, little heady. Yeah, and I did consider uh, transferring to Ole Miss, but uh, I got to Howard and started having a good time. Decided <laughs> to stay there. Yeah, you can do that in yeah. Howard. Yeah. 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 I mean, just a good time in law school. I was, I was mm -hmm. uh, uh, enjoying a lot of law school a lot better than I did undergraduate school. So Reuben transferred to Ole Miss in 65. That's right. the year you entered. That's the year I entered Howard's Law School. Uh, Howard's. Howard's Law School. Howard's Law School. Yeah, I went to Howard's Law School. I never went to Ole Miss Law School. Oh, I thought you said you applied at Ole Miss. No. Oh. No. You went to Howard Law School. Right. Graduated Howard in 65. Right. And then entered law school what year? 65. At 65? Yeah. Oh, you went right into law school. I went right into law school. Okay, I'm sorry, I uh, misconstrued that. Yes, I mean, because that's why I asked you. I didn't have to move. Apprehensions about going to. Uh, okay, because you thought I went to Ole Miss. Because I thought you went to Ole Miss. I did not go to Ole Miss. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, out of law school from Howard, what year? Sixty-eight. Sixty-eight. Okay. So you graduated. 
I went into law school in 68. And what happened? Where did your career take you then? Came back to Mississippi. Back to Mississippi. The NAACP Legal Defense yeah. Education Fund. How'd you get hooked up with NAA? While I was in law school, I, I was working part-time for the Office of Economic Opportunity Legal oh, Services yeah. Programs. Okay. Uh, Office of Legal Services Programs. And they were having difficulty establishing a, um, a legal services program in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And one of the tax that they used to try to break the law jam. There was resistance from, from the organized bar. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent me down to Mississippi to explore the possibility of just setting up, a, setting up an all-black <laughs> uh, 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 legal services program and interview people. And I did. And interviewed Marion Wright. And uh, Marion Wright uh, uh, recruited me to come work in her office. Okay. That was the income? That was the income. Okay. And I, that was interesting to me. Uh, and it was it was at home, and I thought uh, it was time for me to do more uh, for the movement than I had been doing. It was, I needed to come home. You were aware that there were only uh, three black lawyers in Jackson. I time? was I was aware of that. Okay, uh, Cassie Hall. And well, at the time, Jack Young. at the time there were there were a few more. Eddie Tucker, they were. Eddie Tell Tucker, the Eddie Tucker was here by that time. Oh yes, yeah. uh, all right. Uh, and. Well, in any event, I, I focused on coming to that office, and then Reuben was hired by, uh, after that, was hired uh, by the income. By the info. Oh, so he was going to be in the office as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, that made it uh, very comfortable, and that's, that's where I wound up in 1968. When I came here, um, I think I was the 11th uh, black lawyer. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of them, uh, the, the old ones you know, Carl suggested. Yeah, and Jack uh, Young. And Jack Young, plus Sidney Tharp, who was Carson's oh, brother-in-law. Oh, yeah. Uh, those were the ones who were admitted to practice in the 50s. Uh, in the 60s, Eddie Tucker came in 64, 55, and James Abram after him. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got here, both Rubin and Bill Miller uh, from Ole Miss and uh, George West had, had uh, gotten a residency of the year Ole Miss and been admitted and a fellow named uh, Doug Baker. Uh, so uh, right. there were about Who 10 was lawyers. But did Doug Baker was from Doug Baker's from, yeah, he went to Ole Miss and, went to, and he's from Hattiesburg. Right? Hattiesburg, yeah. yeah, I knew Doug Baker. Yeah. Okay. So they all, did they all go to the league in front of work? No, no, no. The only ones at the League of Defense Fund, Reuben, and, and John Nichols came in, oh, August, John. in August of 1968. Oh, yeah. yeah, John had been at, at Tugaloo with Reuben. Oh, he went yeah. to Brown for a year, and then the law school at Emory. And, uh, uh -huh. He joined us in 1968. So when, when, I, when I got there, Paul and Irish Breast left. Marion was already gone. Uh, it was Reuben, Mel Leventhal, oh, yeah. uh, John Nichols, and me. Yeah, I don't what year was that? That was 1968. 68. And let's see, there was you, Mel Levinson, Ruben, and who else? And John Nichols. John Nichols. Okay. All right. And what kinds of things were you doing? Mainly school sc cases. Mainly school cases. Okay. Mainly school cases when. Uh -huh. when uh, uh, Green versus New Kent County uh, was handed down by the Supreme Court in May of 1968. May explain that. And in Green versus New Kent County, the uh, Newton County, New Kent, New, New Kent, Kent County in Virginia. Oh, okay. Uh, that was the case that said that the freedom of choice is not enough. You have to have oh, uh, you have to have plans that work and work yeah. now. And, uh, our task was to file a motion for new plans. By that time, most of the school districts had adopted a, at least a freedom of choice plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and that produced very little uh, desegregation, <laughs> school integration, and none in the black schools. Right. Um, and we began to file motions in all of the school districts. In all the school districts. That, uh, yeah. to, to get new plans. And we, that office represented all the private plans that brought school desegregation suits in the state, except mm -hmm. for one county, that in Marshall County, I think mm -hmm. most of the Memphis lawyers uh, were representing the plaintiffs in that county. Uh, okay. But all the rest of them all throughout the state were, were represented by our office. All right. 
That was that was the only county in the state that was not represented by you all in yeah. terms of it was a legal defense. It was a legal defense fund case, but yeah. it was the only county that our office didn't represent the plaintiffs. Mm -hmm. Now there were other Justice Department cases as well in, in the state oh, right. that, that did not involve private plaintiffs. Uh, okay. And later uh, 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 the uh, office that ruled legal services filed one. See, I remember the, I was in Baltimore, and Marion Rep, well, right. Marion represented the uh, Baltimore County School case, I remember, yes. John Pierce. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I do know. Yeah, Baltimore, all the there were six school districts in Baltimore, we, we had sued five of them, and they did not sue Mount Bayou. I remember <laughs> that, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah that, that was a part of our, uh, yeah, we met, John Pearson was involved in, uh, in, in one of those. So, mm -hmm. uh, I forgot the guy's name from Cleveland. He was Walter Silver's son-in-law. Yeah, John Pearson was Walter Silver's son-in-law, but there was another lawyer in Cleveland who represented the Cleveland School District, and then there was Ansel Cox, who I think represented one of the schools. There were five separate school districts, as well as the school board, except that only did transportation. Mm -hmm. I remember that. That's when they had the, uh, the county superintendent, mm -hmm. right, for every county, plus the, uh, the district superintendents. Yeah. To go along with it. Yeah, yeah, the county superintendent. <laughs> all, all, he, all he managed was the transportation system. Yes. And we had six true. separate school districts with six superintendents. Yeah. And they had a big meeting in Mumbai trying to get to uh, throw out that school district. Uh, uh, there was a hearing that I attended. I remember that one. Okay. Uh, now, what, what was going on politically in the state that uh, came to your uh, attention? During those early years. Well, you, well, obviously a lot of things were going on. Uh, yes, sir. The Voting Rights had, had been, of course, activism and the Voting Rights Act had been uh, passed and, uh, mm -hmm. and registration. Uh, we had the uh, elections of 1967, which number of black people had been elected to office. 34. 34, you think? Yeah. Well, a number had been elected to office. <laughs> Uh, First uh, since Reconstruction. Yeah, and uh, we, uh, in fact, I was married at the time of Tanya Banks. And, oh, yeah. Uh, she was uh, hired to direct the uh, Office for Black Elected Officials that was funded by the uh, Board of Education Project. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you meet Tanya while you were at, 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 at law school? Right? Oh, okay. I met and married in law school. Mm -hmm. uh, she was involved in, in providing technical and legal assistance to, to the uh, new cadre of black elected officials. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard and met Robert Clark, who was uh, mm -hmm. one of those. Uh, I had uh, witnessed uh, Charles Edwards campaigning in the snow for the United States Congress in mm -hmm. the spring of 1968. So, uh, there was a lot going on politically. In 1969, Reuben ran for uh, City Council here in Jackson. Yes, mm -hmm. and I managed his campaign and generally got involved in, in, in political. Were campaign. you in, involved in that campaign? Ruben Anderson's campaign? Yeah, I managed his campaign. So that campaign. year was what? 1969. Yeah. Well, the very first thing that, that, that I was involved in was uh, the, uh, the challenge to the, uh, to the Democratic Party delegation. Okay. And, and, 68 convention, I wrote part of the brief that was presented to the Rules Committee uh, in that challenge. That was the very first political Is that 68? That was 1968. That was Chicago. 1968 Chicago. Yeah, I didn't go to the convention, I just wrote part of the brief. Okay. All right. Now, uh, so Ruben ran for city council, you helped him in his campaign. Yeah. Like, what, did, what did you see out of that? Well, well, Dr. Smith had run. Dr. Smith had run for Congress. Okay. Before that. Before yes. that. Yes. In early in the 60s. Early in the year 64, I believe. Okay. Do you remember that? Yeah, that's from afar. I'm still in Washington. Oh, you in I, I, I remember that it happened. Okay. All right. Well, that's yeah, cool. I don't know whether it was 64 or 66, but he had run. Mm -hmm. Reverend Whitley had run. Cliff Whitley. Yeah. All right. Yes, that's true. And Charles Evans had run in 1968. Okay, where'd you go from there? 
Uh, After that campaign, did you leave Inc. the Inc. Fund? No, we well, we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't leave the Inc. Fund, but we did convert our office into a, a, a private law office. Uh, right. Same people. Mm -hmm. and, but rather than our, our arrangement uh, was that we, we received salaries as if we were legal defense fund employees. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we got a separate check for support of the office. Okay. And beginning in 1969 or early 70, and that arrangement was changed so that we got a retainer, just okay. a flat retainer from the legal defense fund. fund. Right. And we just operated on that and we were building the further expenses that we had as we could, but we received a retainer from the defense fund. Okay, one thing and I didn't ask you about. I didn't ask you about the, uh, the James Meredith episode at Old Miss and what you observed out of that. Where were you then? I was at Howard. You were still at Howard? I was still at Howard. Because that's 63? Yeah, it was 62. So it wasn't it? 62. 60. Let's see, it was before Megan got killed. Well, yeah. Well, Megan was killed in 63, so yeah, I, that's I, right. it was 62. It was, it was 62. September 62. September 62, yeah. I met. Uh, Met uh, American during the summer '61. Okay. And I knew that he was attempting to attend those things. Um, and of course, you know, I grew up in, in, in the era of black five months. And let's see, it's not very well traveled. In '66, you were you still in Washington? Yes. So you weren't here during the uh, Meredith March? No, I wasn't. Okay. But your friend Stokely was. Stokely was. <laughs> Stokely was here. Yes, Stokely was. Stokely was, was, was on the job at every wicked moment. That's true. He still managed to graduate from Howard on time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a feat. <laughs> Quite a feat. Quite a feat. Uh, Okay, now where are we in terms of 69-70? You started private practice, but you still, you guys were still, we're still uh, doing, retained by the... We were retained by the Legal Defense Fund, and uh, Mel Levendahl and I did most of the civil rights work. And Matt okay. Rubin and John Nichols were doing uh, the, the non-civil rights work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and was that was the main school cases. Yeah, well, school cases, mainly school cases. We did school cases. We did some voting rights things. We did some public accommodations. Uh, did some housing cases. Uh, mm -hmm. But mainly school cases. Mainly school. So and we also represented the uh, represented school teachers. And that, that's an output of school cases. Mm -hmm. So we were representing uh, teachers who uh, were supported by. Uh, by by and we have some teachers association, we have different teachers association. Oh yeah. And so teachers who were losing their jobs, we were also working. You represent some of them? Yes. Okay. okay, and now comes uh, the unitary school system. Yeah. How'd that come about? How did you see that? There was a lot of a lot of struggle. Well I was idealistic. I still believe that a unitary school district would, would lead to better things, mm -hmm. uh, better education uh, at, at some point, but mm -hmm. a better society in general. Right. Uh, and, uh, speaking of one thing in the long term, uh, it came about uh, fairly easily in some districts. Uh, it became unitary, but sometimes it became all black. Well, you have, to speak. Left. you have to speak about the flight, white flight. Yes, but that's in the that's private school. That's, that's, exactly, that's exactly that, that happened. Right. I think at the, at, the, at the height of it, well, about 10, 12 percent of the white folks in the population left the schools. What percentage did you assess? About 10 to 12 percent. About 10, at, 10, yeah, 10 to 12 percent? 10 to 12 percent. Look at it statewide. All right. Of the, of the, well, white school age children, about 10% of them went to school districts, the public school districts. Because they left, but they left, they left the droves in the areas where there was a black majority. Exactly right. So, yeah. A lot of 
lot of those were small cannabis industries. And they left in places like Jackson. Yeah. They would not have left in place places like the Lux. True. Long enough to not, mm -hmm. not pull out a white flight in the region in the eastern part of the state. Not in the Delta, that's like a lot of it. A lot, a lot of it in the Delta. The academies open yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, those are smaller white school populations. What did this Sorry. mean in, refer in reference to the kind of work you were doing with school cases? What impact did it have on your work? The white flight? Yes. It had... And the unitary school system. It, well, to my mind, it did not affect the unitary school system. But they decided to leave, and so be it. They left. Uh, to some extent, it, uh, it uh, provided an escape valve for some tensions that might have, might have been there. Had they not left, mm -hmm. uh, we tried as best we could to prevent the wholesale removal of money from the public school system to the private system. Yeah. And we had to mitigate loan programs, tuition programs, federal money, uh, state money. Title one money, too. Title, well, title one money. Because they were trying to pay teachers out of title one money. Yeah, well, I don't know if we have to litigate that. I think the federal government stopped. But we definitely litigated uh, uh, over at the one of the Tallahassee County. They took the football stands and everything. Yeah. Well, they put the I remember the calling the private school. Yeah. Paid all the teachers out of that one for a while. To, for a while. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. so all, okay. that, all that had to be litigated. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and it definitely had an impact. In the Jackson Public Schools, for example, uh, big school district in the state. Uh, in 1969, had about 20,000 white students and about 19,000 blacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and two years later, after desegregation, it was 20,000 blacks and 10,000 blacks. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the numbers. Uh, uh, how numbers long did it take for that that uh, change? In two years. Two years. Two years. Yeah. 1969 to 71. Yeah. Uh, give me that 71 figure again. This is approximately about 20 to 10. About 20 to 10. It went from 50 to 50 to 2 to 1 black. Mm -hmm. And three or four years later, 85% uh, uh, I believe of the students in the north of half of the city mm -hmm. uh, were black. 85% of the educable children yeah. were black. And of course, the city is now 70% black. And uh, church money? Oh, yes, I'm sure that there were. And banks? Well, well, and, well I'm sure, yeah, there were bank loans. No, but I'm sure the banks yeah. got, got sufficient collateral for those loans. Mm -hmm. But there were bank loans. Uh, uh, in fact, one of the council students uh, was up on Beasley Road. Uh, and the school district later, when that school closed, mm -hmm. uh, the Jackson Public Schools tried to buy it. Judgment about the quality of education then and not, as opposed to now. I had a lot in, of things, in your environment, a lot of things. That, yeah, school. a lot of things that, that go into that. And I, I, uh, I lived through and attended Jackson Public Schools during the fifties, mm -hmm. uh, and I know that we had handed down, handed down books and handed down everything. Yeah. I know that our schools, looking at statistics, our schools were crowded, more crowded. Much higher people, uh, uh, people teacher ratios and what have you, and we're under, underfunded in comparison to the other schools. Right. Um, I received a, a decent education. 
position at Lear High School. Uh, but I know that what I got to, and I got the English award in my senior year, I got the math award in my senior, uh, in my senior year, uh, as well as the physical education award in my senior year from there. But when I got to Howard University, I was put in remedial English. Remedial? Remedial English. Mm -hmm. and, and math too? And, 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 and I was told I had a condition in math. I was not put yeah, in Yeah, because I was not, that, that was just an error. I was not put in <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a pretty decent uh, math student, but I had not been exposed to, to uh, uh, to courses that, that 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 children in segregated environments in Virginia and other places mm -hmm. had been exposed to, had not been exposed to analytical uh, geometry, for mm -hmm. example, or, or college algebra, Cal or calculus, calculus and all that. Right. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I wrote a paragraph. In in, I wrote a paragraph. Yeah, in, I don't remember the remedial English, but uh, mm -hmm. I was placed in remedial English by my test score. I got the entrance test at that time. How was that place? Uh, and at that time, uh, Lanier was one of only five students, black students, in the state of Mississippi that were accredited by the Zoning Association mm. of Students. Mm. And there were three schools in Jackson, uh, Meridian, and one other. But that other one was also associated with the junior college, like the Meridian High School at the time, Harris High. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I knew at the time that. that our children were being proud. Right. And uh, what we did was, uh, was create a school system that was not legally segregated. And I can't tell you, because I'm not a sociologist, and I haven't done the statistics, I can't tell you that uh, we would have been better off had we not done that. Right. I know that there are problems in some public schools, uh, but I know that there are public schools children who are, who are uh, doing some great work. Mm -hmm. I know that there are public school teachers and, and administrators who are doing some great work. Uh, largely, a lot of the problem school districts are in our hands, mm -hmm. and not in somebody else's hands. True sure enough. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a question of, of marshaling the resources for but when you were at the time you were doing those school cases, blacks weren't in governance of uh, school uh, boards not, in not most school districts. Absolutely. There were, not, there were very few black school board members. There were no black superintendents other than the Mount Value. Yeah, um, C.J. Jones. <laughs> and, and of course, there, there were some black principals who were kind of given some free reign mm -hmm. what went on in, the, in those schools. But um, in the end, they had to ask to uh, they were black superintendent of white school board. Mm -hmm. So th did the whole process, uh, did we suffer as uh, uh, the uh, the loss greatly of black educators through that whole process of uh, attempting to desegregate education in Mississippi, would you say? It depends on where you were. A lot of black educators remained. Some black educators lost their job. No doubt about that. Some principals were uh, demoted and became assistant principals. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true. We yeah. lost schools too in the process. And we lost some, some schools were closed. Close. Some of them need to be closed. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, but in, in Jackson, for example, uh, we didn't lose a single black principal. Mm. No black administrator. No, no.